Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. It's a conflict that has claimed 7,000 lives in 10 months and forced over 400,000 into famine, yet it has received relatively little coverage in the press. COVID-19 and now recent events in Afghanistan have seen to that. The war between the Ethiopian government and the province of Tigray has also prompted the largest exodus of refugees from the country in two decades, according to the United Nations. Currently, it shows no sign of abating as Tigrayan forces push back Ethiopian government troops and their allies, taking their battle into the neighboring provinces of Amhara and Afar. With us here to explain the source of the conflict and update us as to what's happening now, we have Andres Shipani, the Financial Times' East Africa correspondent. Hello and welcome, Andres. Thank you very much, Nikos. How are you? We're, we're good. Um, Andres, your reporting has shown the increasingly bitter nature of this conflict, one that has spilled over from a political power struggle into ethnic violence, complete with widespread atrocities. But before we get into the actual conflict itself, I think it's worth stepping back a bit and explaining a bit about Ethiopia before the war. Firstly, the federal makeup of Ethiopia and the role of Tigrayans within it. So if everyone can bear with us, can you just take us back before these, these current events took place and just explain a, a bit about Ethiopia's federal structure and the relation between Tigray and the federal government? Yes, thank you, because I mean, if it was a very complex country, it's a very ancient country, uh, estimated two, 3,000 years, and it's one of those countries where who, wherever you talk to, everything goes back to history, but not 20 or 30 years, but 2,000 years, everything goes back to the emperors, Menelik I, Menelik II, Haile Selassie in the century. So uh, Ethiopia, aside from three, four years of Italian uh, invasion during the Second World War is the only country in Africa that was never colonized. Uh, and there's a very proud history. Uh, the royal lineage goes back, they claim, to King Solomon of Israel and Queen Sheba of, of Ethiopia. So, and that's sort of like when things started. So Menelik I, an emperor back in about 2000 years ago, he sort of started shaping what the map of today's Ethiopia, along with its ethnic cleavages. You have to think that today, Ethiopia has roughly 80 ethnic groups and three, four are the main dominant ones in terms of population, Oromo, Amhara, which also is second in terms of population, but culturally has been sort of like the main power and Tigray and the Tigrinias who have over the past 30 years wielded most of the power. And that's where most of the resentment that we're seeing playing out in the battlefield and, and, and the, the political circus come up to stay. But basically over the years, there was what we call the Aksumite empire. There's Aksum, which is located in Tigray. I assume many of the viewers have seen, watched uh, Indiana Jones and the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, that's yeah. the Ethiopians claim that the Ark of the Covenant is actually residing at a church in Aksum. Nobody has seen it. There's one monk guarding it with one key, but nobody can go in. But basically, this is to 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 highlight how much of a proud history Ethiopians have, and how much each ethnic group has its own proud history aside from a national. There's a bit of a schizophrenia in. Uh, this idea of the pan-Ethiopianism and the own sort of like uh, own ethnic uh, mm. ethnic pride, and that plays out every day in the street. In but, the but just just one just to make one one point clear is that the Tigrayans had an unusually large uh, they they dominated the sort of communist exactly. uh, government. So, so happened, yeah, okay, yeah. let me go. Let, let me let me fast forward to yeah. Emperor Haile Selassie. Uh, after the Second World War, Italians, the Ethiopians kicked out the Italians. Eritrea, which will come handy later, uh, was then, it was an Italian colony, it was then brought by the UN and the Brits, sort of like as a protectorate, then it was drawn back into Ethiopia. Ethiopia had access to the sea, today it's landlocked. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 1993, after several disputes, Eritrea becomes an independent nation. But a coup d'etat by the Marxist Turk regime, brutal dictator called Mengistu Halil Mariam, uh, takes power, well, he was a junta in the Mengistu in 1974. They killed the emperor, and basically Ethiopia becomes a satellite of the Soviets. 
And then around that time is when certain, interestingly as well, local Marxist, Leninist, in uh, guerrilla political first and then guerrilla movement starts bubbling up in Ethiopia. One is the TPLF, the Tigress People Liberation Front, which was originally a Marxist Leninist group that didn't believe in impositions from Havana or Moscow, but a sort of like a homegrown Tigray and Marxism. Uh, and over the years, the same thing happened next door in what was then part of Ethiopia, Eritrea, it created its own sort of like guerrilla first political, but then also guerrilla movement, the EPLF. And both aligned started fighting the Derg regime of Mengistu Halimari. To the point that, fast forward till 1991, uh, the world has changed. Uh, there was a war between Somalia and Ethiopia, Soviet Union's collapsing and so on and so forth. Finally, the TPLF manages to take over Addis Ababa, get, I mean, Mengistu flies into exile to Zimbabwe, and the TPLF basically starts running the country. It was a coalition called the EPRDF. It was four ethnically, most of them ethnically associated political parties led by the TPLF and its leader, Meles Zenawi, who was the leader of the TPLF. And the basically, Meles was prime minister until dying in 2012, uh, since roughly the mid 1990s. Uh, I mean, there was a couple of mm. interim, but until Meles, and basically, Meles was responsible for the TPLF and the PRDF. But what, what you were saying, Tigrayans, let's say roughly, or all more, th I mean, Ethiopia has roughly 115 million people. Uh, I mean, nobody knows for sure, but or almost make the majority, 35 million. Um, Hara about 26, 27 million. And then Somalia about 7 million, and then the Tigrayans roughly 6 million. But it has been the Tigrayan who have been running the show for a very long time. And the EPRDF became a very successful machine in terms of development. Meles had this idea of turning, of turning Ethiopia into have a sort of like Asian style economic miracle. Ethiopia, until not long ago, was growing at a 9% clip and brought many people out of poverty. And this was coming after, I mean, the images that many of you saw back in 1984-85 of the famine, mm -hmm. which was during the war between backs basically also because the, war, the famine was also in Tigray, but to integrate the TPLF and Addis um, and the dirt. And the idea was just get rid of that idea now if you're a new country. Okay. So, so, Andres, because we've got to uh, cover, yeah. uh, cover a lot of ground, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here. So just to recap on that, Meles Zanawe dominates Ethiopian politics. He is from Tigray. The TPLF dominate um, through the EPRDF. The yeah. Ethiopian um, People's Revolutionary sure. Democrats dom have dominated Ethiopian politics basically between 1995 2012. But in 2019, you have a different figure, a reformist coming in and essentially removing the TPLF from power at the same time as introducing some big democratic reforms. And so that brings us on to Ethiopia's yeah. current prime minister. Uh, who incidentally, while he's, um, we, you know, we, we see him as waging this war, won the Nobel Peace Prize in, in 2019. So, so go, um, how, how, how does that all work? Tell us about well, um, the Prime Minister. Yeah, what happened, so over those 27 years, the TPLF grew a lot of resentments on the country. I mean, they run it with an iron fist on many fronts, although development was the priority. Uh, and then Meles dies, Haile Mari and Dessalen takes over, quite an effectual prime minister. There's a lot of protest in between, calls for changes, especially the Oromo young, uh, rising in protest, sort of like leading the protest to say, okay, we want a more democratic uh, and more inclusive. Ethiopia, you have to think, and this is very important for what Abi's trying to do, or what he's been trying to do. The EPRDF in 1995, starts a new constitution and has, and is basically, while, you have to think this sort of like coincides like a little after the, John, the Rwandan mm -hmm. genocide. So the biggest nightmare of many African countries back in the day was like separation along ethnic lines. And that's what actually Mellis did. So the constitution created a, what they call an ethno-federalism, which was a huge gamble, but obviously through authoritarianism or 
autocracy in a way was the only way to keep the lead on it and th this is the absolutely fascinating point and I'm, we're going to talk about it later for, for me there are parallels with with yugoslavia here but basically you've got a federal structure in ethiopia with um uh ethnically dominated provinces and a couple of cities with with some federal with them um, with the same kind of powers as well yes and then to the point that there's an article, Article 39, if I'm not mistaken, that actually even allows for secession. So Abiy arrived. So after all these chaos between the death of Meles, Haile Marian, this is this is the new prime minister Abiy Ahmed. Yeah. So yeah. You now there's Haile Marian the Saleng in between, between the death of, of Meles yeah. and then 2018, the EPRDF gathers and say, Abiy is going to be the new prime minister. He's Oromo from the majority. A new face, 42 year old, and bursting with ideas of how to liberalize the economy. You have to think that despite all this development, Ethiopia is still very Soviet, it's still very state led. I mean, yeah. until a month and a half ago, Ethiopia has the largest telecoms monopoly in the world. I mean, banks, foreign banks, and very, very limited operation in Ethiopia. Everything is basically controlled by the state still. Uh, so, Abi comes with very reformist plans on the economy, liberalized the the some of the industries, uh, infrastructure, um, telecoms, and releasing tens of thousands of political prisoners, making peace with Eritrea uh, after sort of like there was a big war, 98, 2000, 2001, 100,000 yeah. people died. Yeah. With a For which war. he wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Exactly. So yeah. there was never a proper, the peace deal was never fully implemented. So then Abby says, let's finish unfinished business, let's release really political prisoner in peace with Eritrea and the strong Manisaya Safavarki. And, and then he create, and in, and he also creates a new political party as well. And, but then, well, that's, bringing, and then that's yeah. that's the claim to tool. This is today. the breaking point. Abi says we are looking ahead, not long in the past. The idea is he creates his new Medamer, he called philosophy, his own green book. It's going to be one united Ethiopia. Let's forget the ethnic cleavages. It's going to be one united, single united Ethiopia, and it calls for, pan, for a pan Ethiopianism. And that started fueling resentment along all political parties that are basically carved along ethnic lines and the, all of these melting pots of ethnic groups. So he creates one party called the Prosperity Party, where most of the parties of the P EPR, the F, join, except the TPLF. Because if TPLF thought that they were going to lose power, and there has been a lot of tension already between the new leadership of the TPLF and Abi. Okay, Andrew, I'm just, I just want to recap yes. because there's so many layers to this. So we've got the... Yeah, we've got, yeah, we've got the, co <laughs> the communist, communist, essentially dominated government, dominated by the Tigrayans, uh, Abby no, 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 no. Out. Well, it yeah. was not a communist. I mean, the yeah. TPRDF was not a communist regime. They got rid of the communist regime. Yeah. They have a sort of like state-led developmental state. Okay. Dominated by Tigrayans, dominated by the TPLF. Abiy um, comes along um, and by 2019 creates the Prosperity Party. The TPLF, not happy, not taking part. Um, and then can we fast forward to elections last year? Well, elections were actually, well, yeah. So... What happens? COVID strikes. So Abby was height of his power. He's Africa's new talisman, the young reformist prime minister. COVID strikes. There were supposed to be elections, the first free and fair elections ever in Ethiopia. Think that the EPRDF won the 2005 elections by 99%. So Abby calls free and fair elections, first one ever, it's going to be in 2020. Uh, COVID strikes, the government says no elections. So we have to postpone that to 2021. Oh, but according to the Ethiopian constitution, the way it works is a prime ministerial system. So there's a president, which is mainly a formality, but then you have the regions vote for its own regional governments. Some regional governments in Ethiopia, and this is very important, have a lot of autonomy. Tigray is one of them, Oromi is one of them, Amhara is one of them, to the point that they have their own, not only armed forces and police, but also its own militias. So, Tigray, which is still run by the TPLF at a regional level, says that's a scam. Elections should be held. Abiy was actually never elected by popular demand. We are going to go ahead with our own elections in Tigray. Adi says, no, you can't. That's illegal. Classic power tussle. Hmm. And then 
the Tigrayan says, mind you, they bring in observers from different bodies, academics, and so on and so forth. So forth. The TPLF wins the election. This was in September last year. At this point, there has already been tension. There was there were killings across the country, especially in Oromia. We can go back into that. So a lot of the country was distracted, mainly focused on what was happening in Oromia. But, and this is still unconfirmed, but all the intelligence reports that we have, or that we read, is that there's been a military buildup on both sides in Tigray, from the federal level and the regional level. On the run up to the election, Abi promises there won't be, he's not going to impose law enforcement on the elections. Just, just ignored them, but he didn't allow journalists to go and cover. But anyway, Tigrayans held elections, win, starts a power tussle, back and forth, back and forth. One day, all, and then this military build, this supposed military mm. builds up in Tigray, where, by the way, because the Tigrayans run the country for so long, the biggest military battalion of the, of the Ethiopian Federal Forces was stationed in Mekele, which is the capital of Tigray. Uh, two less than two months later, one morning, November 4th last year, we were wake up very early to the news that Abi has sent troops to Tigray after he said the TPLF attacked the Northern Command and stole the weapons. Uh, Abi sent troops to Tigray, including like airstrikes to basically quell the rebellion, mm. arrest the leadership of the TPLF. And that's when the war that we are seeing today started. And, and initially, initially, the Ethiopian um, troops and their various allies, they take Michele, they take the um, Tigrayan uh, capital, and supposedly the sort of conflict is over and done well, and dusted within a short period of time, but... Well, yes and no. Uh, so, yes, strikes on Michele, the TPLF atomizes to the point that Tigray, if you see a map, it's a bit like a kidney. So I, so I was in Amhara trying to get into Tigray in the very early days of the war. And, and then all of Western Amhara was basically taken by Ethiopian and Amhara special forces already. And I remember seeing the militias being armed there by okay. the Amhara. Okay. Let's, while we're here, but, let's just bring up a map. This is a map of the, the current conflict and we'll come back to it twice, but let's just bring up here so people can see the geography. So if you this see- This is the situation now. See, if we go it's back, like, we're talking see, about what happened. Yeah, if we say I'm talking, going back a bit. If you see, basically, western to grey is the part marked in yellow. So yeah. that's now under the control of the Amhara. It was a bit close, but basically, that's a disputed land between the Amhara and the Tigray. That's a very long-standing conflict. Yeah. But basically, they took over that part immediately, and then. Weeks later, I remember going to Sudan because we couldn't go. I mean, basically, Addis ring fence with you, it did great. There was no way of going in. So we had to go through Sudan. We went through Sudan to where you see it says yeah. Umera, Hamdayat. So we started seeing the refugees coming through. Ethiopia was still closed. But it seems that by that point, the war seemed irreversible. Uh, and a couple of weeks later, end of November, uh, we said we're going to take over Michele, take over Michele, war is over. Okay, let's just but, lose the map. We'll come back to the map in, in just a second, but we just, just give you the rough geography Eritrea to the north, Sudan to the west, and uh, Ethiopia, you know, um, Tigray being on that sort of upper left hand corner of Ethiopia, just so everyone knows where, where it is. So the, 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 but the Tigrans come back and fairly quickly. Well, but then what happens is, I think we, many of us think that the government is actually baffled. And they kind of, there was a big miscalculation. The Tigrayans are people are a bit like the FARC in Colombia, people who are used to fighting the bush. So these people fought a very strong Ethiopian army backed by the Soviets uh, for 20 something years, and for almost 20 years, and they won. And so they, Melis and Abi was a guerrilla fighter himself. So they retrenched the mountains, but they basically the movement started. And in Tigray, although there was some resentment towards the TPLF, you could say 70-30, 70 pro-TPLF, 
but they all took grains. So many rallied behind the TPLF. And basically the TPLF with all the weapons that they have been, they already had you know, for this military builder that we spoke before, possibly for the weapons that they stole from the Northern Command at the beginning, at the very, the very first day of the war, plus what they've been gathering from the Ethiopian and the Empire forces. They've been amassing a, a, a military buildup. We all assume that maybe red lines with Sudan because Ethiopia, we can, with Eritrea, we can go into the later, is also involved in the war mm. on the side of Abiy Ahmed. Uh, then we get the TPLF and its associated troopers uh, regrouping, rearming, and in a stunning terms of events, taking over Mekele in June, in late June, June 26. Uh, and there's many explanations to this. The one is the war has been a very brutal war. I was only allowed in, I was one of the first generals going back in late February into Tigray. And the level of atrocities we heard, saw, it was like magnanimous. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. And that grew from allegedly Ethiop national federal Ethiopian forces, allegedly Amhara special forces, but also allegedly Eritrean troopers. That it was interestingly that most of the Tigrayans blame Eritrean forces for most of the massacres and, and rapes and so on and so forth. That nurtured a strong pro-Tigrayan feeling, not only an independentist movement, but also pro-TPLF. So many peasants joined and so on and so forth. So brackets here, because it's confusing. Yes, Ethiopia was at war with Eritrea for a long time, but then nobody really knows what the alliance between Abiy Ahmed and Addis Ababa and Isaiah Safaberki, who's the strongman of Eritrea, is. Uh, but Isaias has been, Meles and Isaias, although they are cousins, they were cousins, mm. and although a big chunk of population, in, they're first cousins, so also the population, Eritrea has Tigrayans a lot, and the Tigre, which is a different ethnic group, but they're basically essentially first cousins of the Tigrayans. But the, the TPLF over time and, and the EPLF grew a lot of resentment among each other for several reasons. So Isaiah probably saw an opportunity to vendetta with the TPLF. So there were a lot of Eritrean troops inside. Apparently there still are, I don't know. Uh, but it took the government for months, we've been saying they're there, they're there, they're there. The government was both denying they're not, they're not, they're not. We saw them there when we were there. And then finally in March, Abi says, well, they're there, they're leaving. Apparently according to the humanitarian sources we have, they're still there. Uh, we also heard the digging trenches, also sort of like reviving the old trenches from the old wars, which means they fear an emboldened TPLF now is trying to march into Eritrea. Uh, but so basically, this war has morphed into a very, the government initially labeled, is this a law enforcement operation? The Tigrayans broke the law, they attacked the federal forces, we need to intervene. And it's gonna be swift, but it hasn't. And it became another Ethiopian protracted war, sadly, that is leading to, similar to the 1980s, to famines. I mean, there's been accusations of ethnic cleansing, which are very hard to prove. There's been accusation of the government using, the Ethiopian government using fam famine as a weapon, very hard to prove. Humanitarian but, but agencies complain. of observations of um, government-backed um, militias, government forces, Eritrean forces, also Afar forces of actually stopping UN um, and aid agency convoys from going through into Tigrayan regions and stopping food supplies. And the UN, is, it says 400,000 people are currently in famine. Well, actually, yeah, the latest yeah. number, Samantha Power, the head of USAID, yeah. was there last week. She's now, if not an enemy, enemy number one of the Ethiopian government, enemy number two, but basically there's been a lot of resentment towards the US recently because the US has been very vocal against the government and against the war in general, but saying you need to allow for humanitarian access. The government says we are doing it, but 
supposedly it's not enough. Samantha Power said last week that 900,000 are already in family-like conditions in Tigray, uh, plus 2.2 million probably in the next few months, because you have to think that this was the rainy season is just ending, so there will should be harvest soon, mm. but there was no planting. And most of Tigray is a is an agricultural land. I mean, to the point that one of the very few seed banks in the Horn of Africa was in Nekele, from what I heard has been destroyed. So this, I mean, famine is something that actually builds up and not enough aid is going through for many reasons. Some NGOs have been kicked out. So basically it kind of, we feel, I mean, to the people that cover, I only started covering East Africa disclaimer after a decade in Latin America last year, but for the people that have been following the field for decades, it's sort of like a recast of what happened in previous wars. Yeah, and, and the reading, the reading, the reporting of this. I mean, some of this, it, a lot of this looks very deliberate. Um, there's a CNN account of um, an a, attack on a Tigrayan a community, a church. It seems, uh, you know, fairly systematic. It's not something that's random, uh, where a, a village is, you know, basically the men are taken out and shot and, and executed. Um, and that's a process that happens over several days. And I, was there, I was there. I, I went. I, I went to actually to that. I went to, to see the victims of that massacre. So that's why there are a lot of accusations of alleged ethnic cleansing. A lot of it has been systematic. I mean, you could, if you talk to the rape victims and the victims of massacres, and that's why we still don't know the number. We don't know how many people have died. I mean, you speak to diplomats in Abbey, they say, "I think we're in the tens of thousands," but we don't know. The government has not released numbers. The returns obviously have not, and they and we may not know until there's a truth and reconciliation commission at some point. And we may be talking about many, many, many more people that we imagine. Uh, and a lot of that is systematic, but there's been accusations, and that's the other aspect of the war, the propaganda war. There's been accusations and counter accusations of massacres and, now, and counter massacres. There was an accusation that the TPLF massacred people in, in Afar. There was an accusation that the TPLF massacred people in Humeda. And then there was an accusation that they returned and the Ethiopians massacred people in Aksu and in Dengelat and also in Humeda. And so it's because, again, because the, the region is still ring fenced, as we, we, we can go back, unless the maybe at some point we may be able to go through Sudan, but now we, none of us. The last one was Declan Wolf with the New York Times after the takeover of Michele, but none of us have been able to go back. So, and humanitarian agencies are only trickling in apparently. It's very hard to know what's going on okay, on the okay. ground. Okay. Well, and it is the resorting yeah. to the old methods. Yeah, Let's in, in a moment we'll go back to that map, but um, no. there's so much more to discuss. I mean, I think it's been a really good introduction, both of the political background uh, within Ethiopia, the, the, the differences between the Tigrayans um, and the resentment against them for dominating that government for, for so long, but then also the, a, good, a very good overview of the, of the conflict so far. But we've got a lot more to discuss. Please start putting your questions into the Q&A box here um, so we can put your questions direct to Andres. Dave, let's just bring up that map again, because um, I think the, some of the regional implications here are quite important. Um, <laughs> So, it because, now, yeah. because now, now, since the takeover of Mekele, back from the TPLF, it started spreading. So the TPLF claimed, well, we had to move into Afar and into parts of Amhara to have a buffer zone for the Afar forces and militias not to come back or to come into Tigray. But that means the war has spread. But also the war, this spreading is not only alarming because it has also created humanitarian situations crisis in these parts. Apparently, according to the government, there's now 300,000 new IDPs in the far and in the far and Amhara, and also, I mean, there's starting to be signs of hunger in part of of Afar and Amhara. But also, there's been clashes between the Afar and the Somali, Somali region in Ethiopia, not Somalia, ethnic Somali. That are also there's no long not love lost between parts of Afar and Somali. So, and there's also been, and now the TPLF and the OLA, which is the Oromo Liberation Army, 
which is also excuse this is also a bracket okay government uh, labor I'll stop you there because it's going to get it's going to get too complicated for people let's just hold on for one second let's because there are a lot of thoughts here so just while we've got the map here i'm just going to repeat what some of the things you you've said so the tplf have moved we look at the bottom of that map have moved into amhara they've moved into afar and part of their argument is that um, Haran and Afar militias have moved into Tigran territory, and they're basically saying, look, we're moving into your areas, you need to get out of ours, um, and that, so that's part of the argument. If we look at the west side of the map, you can see that, that yellow area, and that connects with Sudan, and I think strategically the TPLF are talking about trying to make up a, a, okay. a, a ground link with Sudan so that they can get supplies and food and ease ease up the famine. And, and the, well, from what I've been reading, the, the justification for doing that is to try and ease ease the famine. But I, understandably, if you if you have that link with Sudan, Ethiopia is not going to be happy with a. Um, there are no. already allegations that the Sudanese have been getting involved in another conflict anyway. But, but also, there are now tensions between Sudan and Ethiopia for several reasons. So. Yes, uh, there are about 60,000 Tigrayan refugees from this war in Sudan. Now, TPLF has representatives in Sudan, we all know that. There's obviously the fear that there will be lines of supplies, maybe of weapons, we don't know. Uh, obviously the Sudanese will, decline, will deny it, uh, and probably the TPLF. But uh, Sudan, there's been tensions with Sudan. Uh, this is a big geopolitical part. I mean, it's not new. There's always been tensions between Sudan and Ethiopia back in the day from Bashir and al-Bashir and Mengistu. But then also uh, the Ethiopians are building a very big dam on the Nile and which the, the Sudanese and the Egyptians claim is gonna affect the course of the Nile and probably flood them or drought them. So the Sudanese are kind of a pivot. The, the Egyptians are completely against. At first the Sudanese were sort of like, okay, we can understand Ethiopia. But there's there's been a lot of tension between Ethiopia okay. and Sudan. Hold, hold that for a moment because I want to I want to add another thought. And the other the other thing is the access to Djibouti. So Ethiopia um, it values access to. It doesn't have a as you said. It used to have uh, access to the sea. It doesn't now. So it depends upon Eritrea and Djibouti uh, for access to to the sea. And basically, the TPLF are cutting off that link. Well, not with Djibouti yet. There's a there's. The road, there's a road and a railroad through afar. There has been some scattered clashes there. Uh, we all assume that the TPLF wants to basically get there to cut because 95% of Ethiopia's trade goes through the booty. So if you cut the train and the corridor, you basically cut off Addis of very key supplies. Uh, so that's an issue definitely. Uh, and the other side is Sudan. There's also, I mean, the Sudanese have been moving troops to the border. There's a disputed area at the border between Sudan and Ethiopia. It, this is a long dispute called the Al Fashaga Triangle. And that's because Amhara farmers can farm it. It's sort of like a de facto agreement. Amhara farmers can farm in that triangle inside Sudan, but it's still Sudan. But it's been since the war started, sort of the Amhara mm -hmm. saying, well, this is ours. Today is saying no. And there's been some clashes, some Sudanese and Ethiopians yeah. have been okay. killed on the border. Okay. So there's a lot of tension there that hopefully won, but it may explode yeah. to add yeah. another layer yeah. to this. So what, what I'm sort of getting at is that the, the, um, you've got the atrocities, you've got the involvement of Eritrea, you've got potential implications for Sudan there. We have to bear in mind the federal structure and the ethnic makeup of, of Ethiopia. This is this is not easy stuff. And for I mean, my background was um, working in former Yugoslavia, and I covered the conflict there. And for me, the echoes of that constitution with having an ethnically based constitution. You know, this this is all very very worrying. Have things got so bad? And Andres, I mean, it, it really in terms of the sort of the war of words, this is. This seems a conflict that is not going to be solved without without significant outside pressure. The, you have to think that this conflict is taking place. I mean, again, Ethiopia is used to civil wars. It's yeah. such a it's true. But this is happening in a very, very, very sensitive area. You have an Islamist, a jihadist insurgency in Somalia next door. Yeah. You have Eritrea run by a strongman in a country where everybody's basically a conscript. Everybody are 
older 16 year olds of age, I think is a conscript, men and women. And uh, you have South Sudan next door, which has been in a state of more or less on and off conflict since independence 10 years ago. Sudan, which is in still in a transition from the coup against Bashir in 2019, and is the US new best friend in the region, which was used to be Ethiopia. This is part of, this is part of an important geopolitical point. You have Egypt also against Ethiopia, but now increasingly you have, at the, at the, at the beginning of the, of the war, the Emirates was an ally of Abiy Ahmed. Mm. Uh, it was never confirmed, but we kind of know that there were drones involved and those drones were Emirati drones bought or high leased by Ethiopia. We heard that the Americans have put a lot of pressure on the Emirates not to support Ethiopia anymore. But now recently, Abiy went last week or two weeks ago, he went to Ankara to meet Erdogan. Uh, we assume, analysts do so as well, that is because the, the Abiy may be getting uh, Turkish drones now. Uh, so, and Turkey has a big military base in Somalia next door. Somalia and Eritrea are the two allies of uh, Ethiopia in the Horn right now. Sudan, as we said, there's a lot of tension to the point that a couple of weeks ago, Sudan recalled the ambassador from Addis saying, look, we offer you being a mediator, you don't want it. Uh, Kenya is being silent, but I know it's worried. South Sudan is very worried. I was in Somaliland. Recently, the Somalilands are very worried because they don't want to have a refugee crisis that they cannot cope with. So this could have big implications for the Horn. And as you say, the Americans have been raising the voices until basically the takeover of Kabul from the Taliban. Uh, they've been very strong uh, condemning mainly the Ethiopian government, but also the TPLF. Uh, and been trying to get, and the EU from the start. Uh, but, and it, this is a big but, after the takeover of Michele, power has shifted a bit and both sides, and sorry, Abi now has been on a drafting spree. A couple of weeks ago, he said every Ethiopian of age was able to carry a gun should be drafted and uh, or every so they're asking many from civil servants university lecturers and so on and so forth and um, diplomats they're recalling many uh, many diplomats basically to save money to pay for the war effort mm. and both sides are kind of emboldened and especially the cplf side that I don't see this ending now, especially as it's spreading, angering other regions. And the offer of international mediation has been there. I don't think any side will take it now. Uh, the government has always had a very staunch position saying, we are the legitimate government of Ethiopia. And that position has been reinforced after Abiy, sorry, that election that we spoke that it was postponed, it happened in June, Abiy won by a landslide. And but there was no election to Great Britain. Yeah. To Great Britain. Yeah. But, and, and, no, but, what, I, yeah, but what I mean on this, and let me finish on this, is the government said, we are the legitimate government of Ethiopia. We cannot sit down and negotiate with a terrorist group, which to me, coming from a Nobel Peace Prize himself, is debatable because there's an example of another Nobel Peace Prize not long ago, 2016, Juan Manuel Santos of Colombia, who sat down with a terrorist group, the FARC, I'm saying terrorists because both the Ethiopian government and the Colombian government called them a terrorist group, and, and the Americans called the father terrorist group, and they sat down for four years and they inch a peace deal with all its flaws, as most peace mm -hmm. agreements, but at least they, sit, they sat down and talked. Much more I say should in Colombia back in the day as much as in Ethiopia today, but uh, there's a precedent. It has happened. But and I also feel the TPLF will say no because now they're imposing conditions like the Amhara needs to leave Western Tigray, uh, there should be reparations, there should be a truth and reconciliation commission. They said, I don't know if they stepped back from that, but they said a couple of months ago that Abi and Isaya should step down. So it's kind of like a reconcilable position from both sides that it's not boding well for, for yeah. any yeah. attempt. So at in, current, current, in, in Abi's response so far, um, you, you talk about uh, the, the the contact with Turkey. We've done 
a couple of webinars looking at um, Turkey's drones and the, the conflict between in, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and um, the Azeris there. Um, so we, we, we might have an idea of what's coming there. Um, and then um, he's, uh, Abby has had a recruitment drive. Can you just talk briefly about that? And, and that's significant because he's going to different federal regions and recruiting right. from ethnicities in order to do it. You have, I mean, as I said, each region has its own, each of the big regions has its own army. So the Amhara are also on a, on a drafting drive of for Amhara Special Forces and militias. Militias are ba basically ragtag. Sometimes you get farmers who are giving an AK-47 and go and fight. I was hanging out with those guys a couple of months ago. And then you get like the formal structure. I know they've been drafting people for the ENDF, for the actual Ethiopian National Defense Force. Uh, we don't know how many people they want to draft because we don't know how many how many they lost. And we don't know if we ever, ever, ever know how many Ethiopian forces have been killed or how many Tigrayan forces have been killed for that matter, how many Amhara forces have been killed for that matter. We heard from people close to the palace that the goal is something between 200,000 and 500,000 uh, to get ready. So it seems that we are in a stage that the TPLF is kind of encroaching, but also holding back on positions while Addis is regrouping and rearming, be it maybe potentially with Turkish drones, with its own soldiers, uh, and we could get on a stage of an all-out war in the next couple of weeks and months that is probably going to drag on and on. As I said, the Tigrayans are used to fighting, so they fought Emperor Haile Selassie in a rebellion, and they won, and they fought uh, the Dirk with the Soviet apparatus behind them, and they won. So they're used to this kind of fighting. I mean, I remember an Amhara Special Forces telling me that once he was in part of the National Army fighting with Tigrayans, they told me his phrase is something like, they're really home fighters. So they, they know, they, they, sort of, they live with a knife between their teeth and they live in caves. So uh, while they are in, in the guerrilla fight, so this is not new for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, let, let's start uh, bringing in some some questions. Um, we've got Lois Tart um, in Sydney, Australia. We just need to, to bring her up and she'll have a, a first question. Um, while we're getting Lois ready, um, just I want to sort of delve a bit more into that, the, the ethnic tensions, just to underline um, that this isn't just about Tigray province. Um, and actually, I've got Lois here. I'll come back to my question in a second. Hi, Lois. Go ahead with your question. So, um, I was actually in Ethiopia 2014. Um, I was going to the Danakul, where all the volcanoes are. Um, and the one thing I did notice there, because we were driving down the highway to from Addis to Deboti, mm -hmm. and there's a huge amount of Chinese activity, economic activity. They were involved with a lot of infrastructure. We also noticed a lot of the um, soldiers in the Danakul they were all carrying Chinese-made submachine guns. You know, I just really wanted to find out the role of China in all this as well. Uh, China's freaking out because they fear they're not going to get paid. So basically, you're right. I mean, uh, Ethiopia has been one of the main recipients of Chinese investments and lending to the point that in 2018, not very far from where you were, so if you, if you go down into a farm, the old railroad that the French built connecting Addis to Djibouti was replaced by a Chinese made one. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it cost something like $4 billion. And, but to the point that in 2018, one of the first things that Abby did was they had to restructure the loan with the Chinese because they cannot pay back. So a lot of the sugar factories uh, are in the hands of the Chinese. Uh, I know from Chinese investors that they wanted to take a stake on Ethiopian Airlines, which is probably, Af no, probably not. It is Africa's most functional and reliable airline. It's actually making money, uh, but it's 100% stable. Uh, so yes, the Chinese have a very, very heavy presence, but they are worried about, because as I said, now they're trying to get as many funds as possible from everyone. I mean, I got somebody leave me a letter from the University of Addis Ababa I have it here, if you give me one second, of they were asking professors and administrative staff that may earn about $200 for 50% of the salaries to pay for the war effort. Uh, so they're obviously desperate for money. 
30 embassies, they have not been closed, but a chunk, and I know some of those diplomats have been recalled to Addis, except the ambassadors, but the, the, the I mean, CDAs, consuls are back in Addis, uh, just to cut down on costs, among other things. Potentially, these people can be drafted, I don't know. But uh, there's been some defense cooperation with China, it has not been major. Uh, if you see most still, most of the, of the weapons are AK-47 rifles. But yes, yeah, so the, the Emirati drones played a key role. It's a very, it's a very old school war to say, to say it. I mean, you see tanks on the roads, you see Russian trucks blown up on the roads, mm -hmm. you see, and this goes back to Nicholas' point about the ethnic differences. It was very interesting to see in Tigray, a lot of, a lot of Gambela, Gambela are the southern border with South Sudan, which are much darker, much taller. And they have very little in common, for example, with the Tigrayans or the Amhara. They're basically fighting in Tigray. And there's been a lot of, the Gambela have always been by some people in the highlands, the Amhara, the Oromo, and the Tigrayans have always been sort of like, sort of like, sort of like downplayed a bit. So it's interesting how also the ethnic cleavages are playing out in the war. But going back to China, Yes, China is big in Ethiopia when it comes to telecoms, but to, to investment. But for example, it didn't have a big participation on the telecoms beat a month and a half ago, two months ago, which was very interesting. So there is, from what I know, they are just in wait and see mode. They put a lot of money in Djibouti, partly because Djibouti supplies Ethiopia and Ethiopia is the powerhouse of the region. Uh, so my understanding is they're in a bit of wait and see mode to see if they're gonna get paid. A bit like what's happening in Venezuela and Latin America is like, we're really not gonna get involved until we see if we can get paid. Mm -hmm. So in a bit, this is what, and you know, the Chinese, I mean, it could be, they will be very good at jumping at whoever takes the leadership if there's a change in leadership in Ethiopia. Uh, and, Andres, picking up on the point on the point about the, the the style of war, you said it was very old fashioned. Are the, are the Tigrayans fighting with tanks and armored personnel carriers and that kind of thing, or they they, they had it at the beginning them? because they had some they had but as I said they had about having that and they had their own forces. But it's mainly the Ethiopian troops. But you see the tanks around. You see you see tanks blowing up, and then you see char tanks and old Soviet trucks, old Russian who's, trucks. Who's tanks? Up. Who's tanks? Who's Both ones. But it's mainly the thing it's, it's mainly yeah. NDF. I mean, there were some each, so as I said, so each region, each big region has their own armed forces. They mainly have like uh, like light assault. Uh, but most of the tanks are NDF. But uh, if, if you had um, some drone technology, but, you, but, think but hang on a second. Yeah. The, the, all of the fighters associated with the TPLF have been taking weapons of their prisoners of war. So, and they took all the tanks and other heavy machinery, apparently. Yeah. But in your view, do you think uh, sort of Turkish backing for the Ethiopian government would sway, would make a big difference in the conflict? Well, we don't know, but I mean, they, we know, I mean, I, I seen victims of alleged drone attacks when I went to the hospital in when a hospital in Tigray, and apparently the, the drone attacks were a big thing at the beginning because, I mean, the Ethiopian Air Force, they still use Russian mix. Uh, but they don't have that many, and apparently there was an issue with training the pilots. Okay. So they were relying a lot on the drones. So it could make a difference, especially because it's a guerrilla war, so drones are very targeted attacks. Okay. So if they detect something, they go there and they come back. Okay. Uh, we don't know how, if they bother, how many, and what's going to happen, but it could definitely play a difference, mm. especially because of the rugged terrain. So it will be easy for a drone to actually strike on the side of a mountain or a cave and then just leave. Uh, but we still, again, we are in this sort of like limbo now of regrouping and rearming, and we don't, and honestly, we don't know what the TPLF has as well. Okay. Um, in terms of weaponry, I mean. In a moment, we're going to go to Janet Anderson, who's got a, a, a question as well. Um, I, I will also, I just want to um, emphasize the, um, I mean, in, in terms of um, future risks, obviously a significant population and in, in famine, and that could put pressure on on neighbours. But in itself, it's um, you know, is pretty horrendous. Two million people possibly being affected by a famine potentially. Um, the five million, the, the two point two potentially affected by a famine, and five million in need of humanitarian aid as of today. It's horrendous. It's horrendous. 
the 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 other thing issue in the back of my mind is as we've talked about is this, the the different different ethnic uh, the sort of federal structure of the Ethiopia. Could you talk? There was a singer from um, an Oromo singer, Oromian singer, who was um, uh, killed. Um, a very popular singer was it killed a, a year ago, and that led to it was in July last year. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Sorry. So basically, in a way, we, many of us thought. Credit to William Davis and the crisis group, he saw the country was coming into Guyana and Oromia because we thought there was a lot of, there was a lot of focus on Oromia because Abi was an Oromo. But after a while, some of the more nationalist Oromo started seeing Abi as a sort of a traitor to the Oromo cause. It's like Abi pushing for unity and pan Ethiopianism, while the Oromo sort of like pushing for its own ethnic identity. So there was a lot of tension. Uh, and then, especially because the Oromo youth had been quite instrumental in bringing Abbott to power during the protest in 2017 and 2018. Uh, and Ethiopia is a place that is so complex that sometimes you never know what's, what actually happened, which will probably happen with the war. We may not know, never, what happened with most of the atrocities or many of the atrocities. And that happened with the child, so nobody really knows who killed them. There's a lot of theories that basically very popular singer, Oromo national singer, very strong on the Oromo cause. He was very critical of the Amhara, brackets here. The Amhara had been a very potent force in Ethiopia of centuries. Uh, a big chunk of the imperial lineage is Amhara and Oromo. But the Amhara sort of like run the cultural show. The, the official, the main, the lingua franca of Ethiopia is Amharic. Although the Tigrayans speak Tigrayan, the Oromo speak Afan Oromo, the Somali speak Somali, but it's the national language is, is Amharic. Although a chunk of the about 30, 40 percent of, of, of Ethiopians are Muslim, but they're mainly Orthodox Christian, which came from the Amharic culture as well. So the Amharic sort of like monopolized culture for a bit. So they kind of is, is something that people refer to the Amhara elite that in a way is the one that's pulling some of the political strings with whoever is in power, be it Tigrayans and Oromo. So also some groups have resentment towards the Amhara. Um, the Amhara will deny it and so on and so forth. Like, this is the classic Ethiopian polarization that is now very, very, very raw and it's everywhere. You cannot say anything about anybody. But so on that front, yes. Yeah, so Chalu, very critical, he gave an interview a couple of days later, he was shot and killed. That sparked massive protests in Oromia and in Addis because Addis Ababa is a federal entity but the Oromo said it's the capital of Romia, it's a city called Finfine. The Oromo called them Finfine. Uh, so, what the Oromo government is in Yeah, so just to repeat that, Charlie was an incredibly popular um, Oromian singer, Oromo singer. Um, he's critical of the government for their fate, for their cracking down or basically putting pressure on the Oromo. Um, and a few days later, and I'm pushing for unity. unity. Yeah. He's also critical of the Amhara. We talked in yeah. a way. The point, the point is, there are many, many undercurrents there, but you know, which could, oh. if the con con conflict takes a different direction, who knows what could okay, happen? Because, There's a lot of uncertainty there. Because you um, have the, the Amhara resenting some of the Oromo and the Tigrayans, yeah. and the southern nations, the more which are the smaller groups in the south, also resent the bigger groups. And to the point that a week, ten days ago. Uh, the Oromo Liberation Army, which is a guerrilla movement, also a service, but government that operates in Oromia, that wants an independent Oromia, uh, joined, well, pledge allegiance, not allegiance, but in a way, they created a sort of like a de facto allegiance with the CPLA. I mean, that, um, that elements like that, uh, you know. And that, the OLA, really... and the OLA, the last time we spoke with the head of the OLA, Jal Marou, this was back in March, he claimed, no, I'm like 80 kilometers away from Addis. But okay. So you're right. So this could spill over. It's already spilled over into an old conflict between the Tigrayans and the Amhara. It already spilled over into an old conflict between the Afar and the Somali. There's been killings in Oromia, like the one in Uchalu. Mm. The killing of Uchalu, I think there were like eight to 100 people died, as we mm. know. And uh, I, I remember back in, I think, was it Baker, uh, James Baker um, or um, I can't, it was the American Secretary of State uh, at, at the time in 1991, he said, we don't have a dog in this fight. And that was, um, you know, they left Yugoslavia to it until um, they had to do something about it, you know, um, however, four years however, later. Although the risk of the idea of the Ethiopian organization could be real, especially with Tigray, 
now because in a way it has morphed into a war of independence to an extent. We don't know what the TPLF wants. And even if I talk to them, they're not gonna tell me. Probably they wanna march into Asmara and get rid of Isaias and the enemy, their enemy in the East. Mm. They may wanna to march to Addis, but there's a difference. In many parts of Ethiopia, Abi is popular. Mengistu wasn't that popular. So that would be a miscalculation, I think. But then, but we don't know if they want a war of independence to separate Tigray as Eritrea happened, although okay, so Andrew, this, why Eritrea, this, but, but to, one, one, yeah. one caveat on this. Ethiopia, if you if you see the map of Africa changing over centuries, Ethiopia looks roughly the same over centuries. Right. So yes. These stage has always been there and been suppressed by one way or the other, one emperor or the other, one dictator or the other, one war or the other. But to properly break, it could pieces could break up, but the whole thing, okay. like in the Balkans, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good, right. it's a good point. You you mentioned that Abi is is popular. Um, he's obviously popular because of his um, fight with Tigray and pushing against them. And, and as you've, you've talked about, many people resenting the Tigrans, which brings us to Janet Anderson's question, which I'm just going to, to, to shorten. Her question is, you know, what options are there to resolve this issue without resorting to violence? But clearly he's using, he's going down a military uh, you know, road at the moment. He sees that as his main option. But what, what are the options? What, what, what deals could he strike? Uh, with, he's got the popularity. Um, potentially, he's the guy who could deliver a deal. What could he do? Well, he's popular in many parts of Ethiopia, unpopular in others. But by, by, by and large, he is popular. He won an election by a landslide. The election was not fully free and fair, let's be honest. But anyway, but there's another element here. Abi is one of those leaders, as far as I understand it, and after talking to a lot of people in his entourage, and my editor who sat down with him for three hours, there's a bit of manifest destiny in his own self as a leader. Right. Uh, he's an evangelical Christian, not, a, not an Orthodox, not a Muslim. And there's a bit of this idea of talking directly to God apparently. So he's, he has this, his idea of a united Pan-Ethiopian, a united Ethiopia, Pan-Ethiopian is, is very much there. And he wants to get there. Uh, what's the cost? We don't know. What the TPLF wants to do with that? We have to wait and see in the next few weeks, months. I don't think this is going to be resolved easily, unfortunately. I don't, I cannot see from the position of both sides now, uh, and both sides means TPLF and its degree and associate fighters, and Addis and the Amhara and those others on those other entities within Ethiopia that support him in this particular war effort. Uh, of a peaceful resolution because they are not willing to sit down and talk to each other, number one. International pressure in a country like Ethiopia has limits. Ethiopia will always say, number one, African solutions for African problems. Number two, Ethiopia is too old of a country for you Americans or Brits or Brussels to come and tell me what to do. We are an ancient civilization, we survive forever, we don't need you. Uh, they may listen to the Africans, but they, and this is a very important point, the African Union is in Addis. And the African Union has not been very spoken on what's going on. So that reflects a bit of a power, of, 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 of this sort of like power pressure on the African Union in Addis. Um, a foreign military intervention, I doubt it. I mean, definitely not the US after what's happened, what we saw happen in Afghanistan. Uh, other African troops, mm, Look, today I was just seeing the Sudan asked uh, Ethiopia to remove their peacekeepers from the mission in Sudan, the Ethiopian peacekeepers. Uh, so if Sudan gets involved in the war somehow, this could have ramifications on the Americans because Sudan is a fragile new ally. They may feel some way of intervening, but to be honest, it's very hard to see now that there would be a peaceful resolution right now. It seems that Addis wants to get rid of it. I mean, if you see the language of the statements of the prime minister's office, mm. they want to get rid of the TPLF once and for all. They call them, they don't talk about Tigray, they talk about the TPLF. They call them wheat, uh, uh, click, junta. So it seems kind of inevitable. This is Ethiopia, it's very volatile, it has always been very volatile. 
I don't want to say it out loud very much, but possibilities of Kuz and Magni's eyes are always there. There was an attempt on Abby's life a couple of years ago before this war. Uh, obviously, that's not, it's not going to get to that. But there's always, again, the intransigence of both sides makes it very hard at this point to be a peaceful resolution unless, because the CPLF is demanding too much from what Addis would like to give and vice versa. So, okay. and the government has been dismissing potential like Sudan, the same is, is, is on a neutral part here. And to be honest, I don't know who will be willing to mediate. That's the other big question. Andres, there we have to wrap it up. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, it's uh, a pretty ab abysmal situation. And from what you've been saying just now, um, it looks like that we're going to be talking about this for many, many um, months to come, uh, if not longer, which is pretty okay, grim. No, and um, the, re the reporting from it about the, in terms of human rights abuses, not to mention the, the, the famine, it's all pretty appalling. Andres Shapani, the Financial Times uh, correspondent in East Africa, thank you so much. And hopefully we can speak to you again in the not too distant future.